welcome back to the channel. Today I'm delighted to be joined by the vegan calisthenics coach Stefano Rinaldo. I hope I didn't butcher that too much, uh, the pronunciation, but he's been vegan for nearly six years now and got he's got a massive following on Instagram for the vegan message. And if anyone's seen his profile, I'll put on picture uh, on screen now some pictures of his physique, but it's quite impressive. I like how he's, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> the proof's in the pudding, but I like how he's dispelling a lot of myths in the vegan community because a lot of people think you can't build muscle on this lifestyle. So Stefano, if you wouldn't mind, could you give a little introduction for the people, just how your journey into like a vegan lifestyle started and yeah, your fitness journey as well. So where it kind of started for you. Absolutely, man. So thank you for for having me. And uh, yeah, I've been vegan for six years <clears throat> and uh, it's been a mixture between being plant based for the environment and then vegan for ethical reasons. So not to be part of animal exploitation. And uh, it started with, with, with a trip in Asia. So I went to Asia. I traveled Philippines. Cambodia and Laos. It was a three months, two months trip. Uh, and I got a food, food intoxication. So I had fever, I was vomiting, I had diarrhea, I was horrible. But it gave me time to watch some documentaries because while I was there, I noticed how the human is impacting, impacting the environment. You can really see there in Asia because they don't have the Low, low enforcement and technologies that we have in Europe, mm -hmm. right? And so I would see like some rivers were purple, you know, and you could see that there was not a way of reducing the impact of human to the environment. And so I was very interested in knowing more about that, what's going on. And so I saw Cowspiracy, I remember, and I was like, wow. I don't want to do anything to do with it. Like the, the world is fucked. We are destroying it completely. <clears throat> and so for me, that was a uh, good enough and something weird happened. Like I wanted to, from after conspiracy, I wanted to be pescatarian. You know, fish was the, the, the one thing that I really liked when it comes to taste. And um, I thought it was also like the healthiest choice when it comes to animal products. Uh, but something happened still when I was in, in Philippines. I saw this boat who were, had the engine on and exhaust was putting out black, uh, you know, um, how do you call it? Fumes. The thing. Yeah, fumes. Or yeah, emissions. black yeah, black steam emissions. And I, w I would see that going straight down into the water. And, I, and for some reason, looking at that was like, no, no, no. Pescatarian is also not okay. And uh, so... I went basically almost 100% plant-based. <clears throat> uh, but you know, there was a weird thing that even though I personally was so, I was so convinced that being plant-based was the right thing to do, I noticed that when I was having conversations with, uh, with people about it, it was very difficult to get the point across and convince people that there was the right thing to do. Uh, because at the end of the day, because I, I should say that at the time, I thought I was vegan, right? I thought I would, I would use the term vegan instead of mm -hmm. plant-based, right? Uh, but the reality is you, you, you're you not vegan for the environment because practically you can eat some animal products without, you know, being that negatively um, impacting the environment. Right. So let's say you really have these backyard chickens. Right. So that's not going to do much to the environment. Uh, probably a vegan who is a airplane pilot, for example, and driving a airplane every single day, it's probably doing worse to the environment. <clears throat> so mm. being vegan for the environment doesn't make really, really uh, doesn't make sense. And uh, um, of course, being plant based and eating mostly a plant based diet is going to reduce your impact. That's for sure. Uh, and then during COVID, I started to build my online business. You know, I was a personal trainer already in London. COVID hit, gym closed, lost all of my clients. 
which by the way, as I was a personal trainer in the gym, I wasn't very comfortable about talking about nutrition with my clients because I didn't want to suggest any more products because even though it was for the environment, I still thought it was important to avoid the consumption of, consumption, of, consumption of animal products and also for the health part too. But anyway, I lost all my clients and, uh, and they closed the gym. So I started to try and do my thing online. Um, and at some point, I started to properly learn how to do marketing online and how to create content. And one of the things that I learned from one of my first business coaches was that you really have to express your ideology and yourself mm. when you're creating content. And so one of the things that I was strong on was being vegan, even though I wasn't vegan, but I was plant-based. So I started to research okay, what are the vegans doing out there? And uh, I stumbled upon Joy Carbstrong um, mainly. So I think Joy Carbstrong was the, the main one that I found at the time. And so I immediately noticed that the conversation, so he was having these debates with non-vegans on the street, um, starting them with a sentence that would say, you know, if you're not vegan, you are an animal abuser, prove me wrong. And so it would start a lot of debates with non-vegans on the streets. Um, and so, I, yeah, I realized that the conversation was never really about environment, but was about a moral obligation of not causing animal harm, not exploiting animals. And so another thing that I had to make the connection with was recognizing animals as individuals and it helped me do that too because when I was young I I saw a lot of family farms so I would see rabbits mm. in cages chickens in cages I saw a pig being uh being murdered and that was crazy like you know the farmer was like let the kid watch mm. you know watch the slaughtering of the pig Wow. What's going on with society, you know? I was six years old when that happened, you know? And it was a bit traumatizing. But uh, for the small animals, I, I, I noticed that, especially now, I noticed how I was conditioned to, to see that as normal. Yeah? These are small animals. You take them, you kill them, you put them in cages. So my mind was pretty brainwashed and had a pretty strong species way of thinking where animals are below humans even though i had a dog i still and and i treat and i treated him very well at the time i still thought that you know the dog was there only for me you know he was there for me i didn't see him as an individual that's just there and as you know deserve the fully in same respect that humans deserve and so Joy Carlson helped me understand that, you know, they are people, they're different, they're, they have pose, they don't talk our language, but inside them, there is a person. They might be less complex than us, than us, that's for sure, you know? but, you know, they're people. And so that, together with watching slaughterhouse footage, which I never saw, I mean, I did see it, of course, slaughtering when I was a kid, uh, but... You know, in this moment, I was making a better connection to to the animals. And yeah, I remember one of the things that shocked me the most, impacted me the most, was watching pigs in, uh, uh, how do you call it, farrowing crates. I think that's the right mm -hmm. term. So where they put the female pig to procreate and be consistently pregnant to... Uh, to give birth to piglets and consistently, you know, feed those piglets so they can fatten up, grow, and and go to slaughter. So, like, that was horrible to to think that uh, you you would have to be a whole existence, you know, live your whole life in a cage to then go to slaughterhouse because all these female pigs they go to slaughter. So that was crazy. And another thing that allowed me to make the connection with animals was that because I started to work online, I felt like it was the time to adopt a dog 
because I could, he, he wouldn't be alone. So I adopted a, a dog. And, um, and in this moment, when I was looking at slaughterhouse footage, so I watched Dominion, I, uh, Dominion, uh, if you haven't watched what happens in meat, dairy, and eggs and animal products, behind animal products, you should be watching Dominion on YouTube. And so while I was watching all these horrible practices and torture that animals have to go through, then I would look at my dog and she was on the sofa chilling, you know, I think like, this is horrible. Just imagine like having her to which of them I have now such a good connection with in this situation. That's so wrong, especially because also like in this period, I, I already knew I could live without animal products, right? And so this is my vegan story. Uh, I also should say that in these same moments, especially listening to Joy Carlstrong debates, I knew I could do that. You know, I, I, I knew I could overcome those uh, dumb arguments against veganism. So I, I, I wanted to do the same thing and do activism that way. How did that sound? Mm. Do you want to expand on my vegan story or? Yeah. Can you just repeat it all again, please? <laughs> yeah no no it's great and obviously you got into calisthenics maybe like yeah. was it five years ago or so how did you notice were there any health benefits when you went plant-based or and then vegan like were there did you notice any benefits to your recovery or energy or things like that well yeah there's so much to say i think about it because so many benefits, but my life overall, like changed, changed a lot. So let, let, let's talk about the, like the baseline of who I am. I am asthmatic. So, um, since I was a kid, kid I'm, I'm, I was asthmatic and, um, I've been a kid that used to get sick a lot. And bad, you know, it's not just a little cough or a little flu. If I get sick, it was, you know, antibiotics, high fever, not going to school for a whole week or two. So it, it was never, was never light. And overall, I would say I was someone with, um, not like hyper energy levels, always the kind of, kind of little tired. So. When it comes to going, starting, uh, you know, a plant-based diet, there, there are two stories around how I felt after going plant-based. The, the first part is a good part. So I actually started to have uh, more energies overall, like not more energy, but I would say more stable energies. But these, um, like this change, this quick benefit, let's say, didn't last long because I wasn't working uh, that much. But then I started to work as a coach about six months, one year after I made the switch. And I was standing a lot. Um, before being a coach, I was a bartender. And when I was a bartender, I was drinking and eating, like snacking all the time behind the bar. So it sounds like unhealthy, but actually it was a natural way of supporting all the energy expenditure that I was going through my day because I was mm. supposed to training and standing 10, 12 hours per day. So I actually needed all those extra energy, even though alcohol is not the best energy that you can, energy that you can get, it's, it's still some. And so when I started being a coach, this snack went away for the most part, the drinking, you know, especially drinking every day definitely uh went away and i didn't have the snacks from the bar so what happened uh, i started to go through a period of low energy levels and um, i was waking up tired i was going to sleep tired and it started to get worse like i i got to a point when i was uh, literally having brain fog every day some kind of headache every day waking up with a headache like my my life was horrible and on top of this, on top of this, being a coach, you need to wake up very early in the morning. I've never been an early, an early morning person, so it was not the right time for that to happen. 
Um, and then another thing that is uh, really hit my masculine ego was that I didn't really want to have sex with my girlfriend, right? And it wasn't much, it wasn't as much as a biological and physical thing. It was more of a, I, I don't want to do this, you know, I just want to rest. And so I knew something was wrong. And obviously you are bombarded from vegans are malnourished. And so, you know, I, I was buying into that. I was like, okay, what am I missing? Is it B12? Is it, what is it? So the first thing that I thought um, it might be a problem was actually some nutrient deficiency. And, uh, uh, my physiotherapist, I don't know why I listened to him. He told me that I should increase the B12 intake and uh, B6 and vitamin D. But then I actually did a blood test um, and realized that I didn't have any nutrient deficiencies. Actually, my B12 was too high and he suggested me to stop supplementing B12. And, uh, and then I start to look into fasting. So I learned that fasting can get you into autophagy, regenerate uh, the cells, which is something that I, uh, I support. I, I love fasting as a tool to optimize your health, but that wasn't the solution at the time though. Um, so I, was, I, I did even three days fast. And even though after three days fast, you know, when you eat again, you, you feel fucking amazing, you know, but uh, that, did, that did not solve the problem. I was still tired. And I don't, know, I don't know how much this struggle with energy level lasts. I think we're talking anywhere between three, five months. Well, it was a very long time. It was very frustrating. Until I stumbled upon a book, a book that's called Plant-Based Sports Nutrition. And there it was, the importance of eating enough calories and the symptoms that you can experience if you are, uh, you know, if you're doing an uncontrolled and prolonged caloric deficit. And all my symptoms were there, uh, brain fog, low energy levels, low libido, right? And headache, everything was there. And it's crazy how simple was the solution i just had to eat more so mm -hmm. and so doing the that was the first time that i got into calorie counting but by the way like when i was into this uh low energy level period i was shred more shredded than ever than never before in my life because even though i was tired tired i was still pushing through my workout i wouldn't skip my workout i was tired but still still, still going all in my workout. So I looked amazing. I, I had a super shredded six pack. I think I had, uh, we did a measurement. I had four 60 millimeter at the abdominal fat. So now I'm about 10 millimeter. Usually I'm between eight millimeter and 10, but then I was like four. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but yeah, it turns out that I was eating some days only 2,500, maybe even less calories. And uh, what I needed was anywhere, you know, between 3,000 and 4,000 calories. And so I started to, to push it pretty high, actually. I started to eat 4,000 calories per day. And three days of being consistent with my calories, I felt great again. And, uh, and I like this part of the story because there was a weekend just, just after I started to, to watch my calories and make sure I ate enough food, which I had sex with my girlfriend like three times. And, uh, and she was like, what, what's, what's going on? What happened to you? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I tell her, I told you that there was something wrong with me, you know, that there was not me, there was something wrong. And it was just about calories. I just needed to eat more. <laughs> the solution was so simple, but, mm. um, there it was. And uh, we can relate and connect to the malnourished vegan stories and the fruitarians and raw vegans that, um, by the way, when they stopped being vegans, for the most part, they are, they were never vegan. They went plant-based for, 
for health reasons, but you know they they didn't understand deeply how their nutrition should be organized, right? They they only went, okay, I'm going raw, or I'm gonna only eat fruits. But yeah, then if you don't eat enough, you're not nourishing your body properly, and uh, this is why uh, then they have some deficiencies. They feel very low in energy levels, and they go back to eating animal products uh, because animal products are high in fat. So for the most part, they they are they are, they are higher in calories. So mm. it's easier to get more calories in, um, for the most part, we could say. But it's also easy on a vegan diet once you know once you know how you have to. Eat. The thing is, you're used to eating that way, so you need to spend some time to understand how you have to organize your your new diet. And so, and after that, things started to to feel pretty good. Um, I actually, you know, as I said before, as I said before, I used to get sick as a kid often, uh, as a vegan in, in all this time, part the low energy levels, but when it comes to actually get sick, sick and get virus and fever, stuff like that, uh, I always, I only had very strong symptoms with COVID, but apart from COVID, I... I didn't experience nothing similar to when I was not a vegan. So now finally I can I can get slightly sick, you know, just a little bit of mucus, maybe a little tired, but it stays there, you know, just a, how do you call it, seasonal flu, is that the right name, right? And uh, and so yeah, so I'm de- I definitely feel my my metabolism is stronger in, in fighting. Uh, mm. viruses, diseases, and again, energy levels are definitely uh, more stable throughout the day, right? And when it comes to performances in strength, so so here's the thing, like as I, as I went vegan, I also became a coach. So before being a coach, I wasn't that knowledgeable about how to train. So as I started uh, knowing more and being a better in training and more efficient, you know, I started to get better results and get stronger in calisthenics. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't say, you know, the, the plant-based diet gave me some kind of boost, but I, I feel good, you know, I, but like when it comes to recovery, I don't really have soreness muscle soreness after the day after my workouts only for my legs but i think like if you if you do a good leg workout man your legs gotta be Pretty sore <laughs> they got to be sore i know but another thing that but for, for me that's the most important part right it's about about progressing over time if i'm able to progress in what i do in my athletic performance that it means that a plant-based diet is completely fine, right? And um, many people hate on you because you're not the the best meat eater on the war in the world, right? This is what I get usually uh, on social media, but yeah, that, that's not the point, you know. <laughs> the point is, can I get stronger? Are you making improvement? Yes, you can. Eventually, you you, you know, you can be a champion uh, as a vegan as a vegan as well, but you know, to the question, can a plant-based diet support your goals? 100%. Another thing that I did as a vegan, and I started from zero, um, not only from zero, from being asthmatic, I started running. And when I started running, I know, that was horrible. Like, 15 minutes runs were absolutely horrible for me. I couldn't, you know, I, 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 I was stuck with 15 minute runs for a good bunch of time because when you're asthmatic, it's not only about the breathing, but you know, your ability to uh, use oxygen is mm-hmm. less efficient than normal people. So you get fatigue quicker. And uh, I managed to do a half marathon. So I started running, started running four years ago. And this year I've done four half marathons so yeah healthy and strong (laughs) definitely 
yeah so people might be curious like what does a day in the life look like so in terms of training obviously you'll be on some kind of workout split but what does like a typical day look like for you um you want me to explain it around the training yeah i'd say like training based yeah yeah so the, the thing with me is uh I, I like to do all the things that i like so you know i have it's also a trait of having adhd right you you you're always interested in different things and uh, the things that i i enjoy of course i need to limit myself because otherwise you, you don't do anything uh properly but so i calisthenics is my main thing you know strength is is what i'm what i'm more attached to because it really helped me become a more confident person and find my way through life i would say you know when i was young i was bullied uh i never really knew how to talk with girls stuff like that and uh, uh, when I found the gym, strength made me feel happy about myself and uh, girls would have a reason to get interested in me. You know, some girls like strong guys and so that would help me break the ice. So, you know, uh, strength training is, is what I'm more attached to. I would never, never, ever stop strength training. Uh, but anyway, there is also kickboxing and there is now running so running is more of a recent thing but i am getting more and more passionate into running also because i see myself when i get old to ultra marathon runner uh, runs right so that's that's what i think i'm going to be doing and um so my calisthenics training is four times per week and um i i train at home i love to train at home like in the future i would love to have a bigger house with a bigger gym and do legs as well at home but yeah but I, I, you know as i said before like when i wake up i'm not really quick in activating the brain so i work out around half past 11 um including warm-up and mobility work that's about one hour and a half so that's four times per week monday wednesday sorry monday tuesday wednesday and friday it's a push Full legs and then an upper body uh, split for my strength mm -hmm. training uh, and then I basically do cardio every day either running or kickboxing so I try to do three three running days and three kickboxing kickboxing days mm. yeah nice I think that's a good balance I've recently started um, incorporating a bit of boxing training and it's really it's good like you say for the cardio side but also i feel like it's a great way to channel your anger and like let out anger and emotions and kind of yeah it just it just seems really rewarding it's like i like something to master and i think it's quite it's quite a good thing to pursue and <laughs> yeah. i love the birds by the way it's just it's a real like authentic vibe <laughs> yeah but in terms of like training what mistakes do you notice beginners make because a lot of people they've been work some people have been like working out for years but they've not seen any progress what what kind of common mistakes do you see why people are not building muscle yeah um there's so many mistakes i think we can we can start with the first mistake of thinking that nutrition is the priority all right you you often here, fitness influencer talking about nutrition and relating it to building muscle or, you know, you need to bulk. So you have to be in a caloric surplus and get fat and force feed yourself to, uh, to build muscle, or you need to eat uh, 1.6 kilograms of protein per kilogram of body weight today. Under one of my posts, the guy said two gram of protein per pound, which in kilogram is, is the, what is it? 3.5. The fuck are yeah, you talking like 2. about? 2.2 or something. It's, yeah, it's over double. It's... Yeah, and nonsense. So, and, uh, and here's the thing. This is, uh, this is just a simple bullshit. So I, I think, I think the reason why there's so much 
talk about nutritional there is because overall, and uh, don't get offended uh, as you're listening to this, but overall, population is, is weak, uh, has a weak mentality, and they like easy fixes. And it's much easier for you to buy into a reel that tell you, this is why you're not building muscle. It's because you need to increase the protein intake inside of your meal. How difficult it is to increase your protein intake. I mean, like, it's a really, if you want to do it, you just buy protein powder, for example, you've done it, done. So it, it's an easy fix. It sounds sounds doable. And that's why is the kind of, it's a very strong narrative uh, out there. On the other side, it doesn't sound that good if I tell you, look, you have to work out three to four times per week. You need to know what you're doing. You need to take notes. You need to make progress week after week, making sure that you're pushing hard for it. And you need to do it for three years if you want to build 10 kilograms of muscle. And that doesn't sound that good. Right? You cannot just, you cannot just do it. So that's the first mistake, you know, thinking that uh, nutrition is going to is, go, is going to do some magic to to your progress. Uh, which again, I, I think nutrition is definitely important to support you. But I think you should look at nutrition as a way of optimizing your health and, and nourish your body the best way possible. And as a result, you will be able to uh, to have the energies to to work out and recover uh, efficiently. Right, so my point, so my here my point is when it comes to like for example, protein and bulking, you know, pro high protein, low protein, fine, you build muscle anyway. Uh, you want to bulk, you want to main gain, you want to recomp, you want to do a deficit, you can build muscle in all of these scenario. What do you actually need though? So what, if if everything does all the other these other things don't matter, what does matter? And that is the progression in strength. You need to get stronger. Like when I have conversation with, with uh, potential, you know, clients, people interested in my in my coaching my coaching program, uh, and I really struggle to to build muscle. Okay. And uh, what are you doing in in terms of training? Oh, you know, I do a bit of yoga. Sometimes I do some pull ups. And uh, push-ups, you know, I'm not very consistent. You're not struggling to build muscle. You, you're not trying, <laughs> or you know, you don't know how to do it, right? So sometimes when I, because I'm insecure as well, right? Because now with social media, you got so many people that are bigger and stronger, and you, 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 you feel like you, <laughs> you know. Then when you, when you go to the gym and uh, you do a reality check, then I feel strong again because I'm actually one of the strongest guys, right? Uh, but uh, but yeah, often I, I look at these bigger guys and I say, okay, wh what are they doing? And usually they are also stronger than me. And, and, and that's the key factor, right? So if you are stronger, your muscle will, will grow as a consequence. So that should be your focus and not much, uh, neither your nutrition, neither necessarily the, the scale, if scale is going up or down, because at the end of the day, also the amount of muscle that you're going to put on is also decided by your genetics, right? So you cannot necessarily control that that much, even though if you are a beginner and you don't have much experience, I am 99% sure that you can at least put five kilograms of muscle on. Even if you are, if you have most horrible genetics, I think five kilograms is, is fair to achieve for everyone. And most people can do 10 and some people can do 15. Very few people can do 20, right? That's, that's when also people need to be realistic about, about their goal, right? And so when I, when I say that, when I say you need to, if, if you get stronger, you build muscle. Sometimes I get people saying, uh, well, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you build muscle, right? There's so many people that are small, but they're super strong. And here's the thing. Yes, you can train in a way that will stimulate more strength compared to muscle growth. Why? Because strength is the ability of your central nervous system to fire up as 
many muscle fiber at the same moment to be efficient in exerting power, okay? Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily need more muscle, bigger muscle to, to create more power if you train from strength specifically. But at the same time, what happens once you, have, you are super efficient? To get stronger, you need to build muscle. So you can train in a way that you are more focused on hypertrophy and muscle building than, than strength and the other way around. But, you know, there is no strength without muscles and there is no muscle without strength. So that needs to go up. Okay, so if that's, if you're doing strength training, some kind of strength training, like if you're making progress, you will build muscle. And that's also why I, another thing that I want people uh, to understand and get free from is that, you know, you don't have to be fixated on a way of training. All right, so you're going to have some fitness influencer telling you, need to do, you need to go to failure and do 50 reps. Other will say, stay on the three to five repetitions range. Some will say 10 sets. Some will say 20 sets. Some will say, do a push-pull legs. Some other would say, do a bro split. Others would say, do calisthenics. Others would say, do weight training. It doesn't matter. As long as it is strength training and you are making progress, that's the key point making progress over time, mm. you are going into the right direction. You're good. You're good. And if your nutrition is not okay, you will feel it. If your nutrition is not okay, it's probably because you're not eating enough calories to fuel your workout. I don't think, uh, I mean, it's not, I don't think, uh, People, some people will, will think that it's just an opinion that I have, but, uh, it's a fact that low or high protein intake doesn't make a lot of difference. You know, the, you know, studies and science show that there's some benefit and some and partly, you know, optimization in the rate at which you make gains, but these optimization and extra gains come down to only 8%. So it's, it's not much at all. Again, if we go back to the max amount of muscle that someone can build over maybe 10 years, I mean, in 10 years, you might build 15 kilogram of muscle, you know, what's the 8%, 8% of that? No idea. Maybe one kilogram. I don't know. That's <laughs> really random. Yeah. It's a really random math, but it's something like that. And it's just not much. So focus more on your, your strength progression. Uh, other mistakes, especially when it comes to calisthenics, because I feel like, you know, even if you don't know what calisthenics is, you probably want to work out at home, right? This is, this is why usually my clients also start working with me because they don't like going to a gym. I also don't like, uh, sometimes I do like going to the gym, but you know, let's be honest, especially if you do a body building type of workout and you go during busy time at the gym, that's mm, that's a nightmare, hours, yeah. right? You need to, yeah, lots of people. You need to wait for the machine. And um, working at home with calisthenics, you need minimal equipment. You can and you can save time. And so, what are the most common questions? So the first mistake that I see is that people think that calisthenics is pull up and push ups. <laughs> there is more, and uh, especially regular pull ups and regular push ups. So what happens? Usually what happens is that doing um, regular push-ups becomes a not enough stimulus anymore to make progress. Imagine the difference between, you know, sprinting and, and the marathon, right? Sprinters have a lot of muscle. Marathon runners usually are ski, a, a kind of skinny. So if you get your way up with push-ups, 100, 200, 300, that's not an optimal way to, to build the strength and muscle. You're working on something that's called strength endurance, uh, which can also get you to, to build muscle, but you need a lot of volume. You really need a lot of volume. It's not an optimal way to, uh, to train and progress over time. Um, and so you want to uh, make progress, just like you do at the gym, if you've tried gym sometime, right? If you 
if you've gone to the gym for like two months and you do your bench press, you try to go up in weight and you kind of stay within the same rep range, maybe eight to 12, right? And you add a kilogram, you add five kilograms, something like that. Um, you want to do the same with calisthenics. Push-ups will become too, too easy for you and uh, you need to add some extra resistance. You need to increase the intensity. You can do it by adding weight. You can do it by moving towards uh, unil the unilateral kind of uh, variation of the exercise, so one arm push-ups, side to side push-ups, but you have to make it more difficult, okay? On the other side, we have regular pull-ups and that, what happens there usually is the opposite, is that people think that just because it's something that you do with uh, your own body weight, it's supposed to be easy or you're supposed to be able to do it and pull-ups are a hard exercise, especially if you weigh more than 70 kilograms. Proper pull-ups are hard. Like, uh, I'm, I'm still doing pull-ups without any extra weight uh, in my, as my, you know, last exercise, right? And I do sets of between 10 and, and 13, right? So I'm still being very effective by doing these, these exercises in my workouts. And so what happens with regular pull-ups is that people think they're doing pull-up, but they're not doing pull-ups. They are, they are doing, you know, very ineffective technique. They're not going all the way down or they're not going all the way up. And, and they get stuck there because you're basically allowing your muscle to work at a comfortable position, okay? And you're not challenging the muscle to get stronger. And so what, what needs to happen there, and this is, this is I, think, I think this is one of the most important concepts to understand in order to make calisthenics training effective, which is you got to be humble, all right? So in the gym, we know about the ego lifting, right? when you want to go and lift every weight, but ego lifting works much better in the gym than with calisthenics. Because at the end of the day, you know, ego lifting, you're probably going to break your bones at some point. But if you lift a heavy weight, you're still lifting a heavy weight, a heavier weight. You're still, uh, you know, challenging your muscle more and more. But in calisthenics, because you don't have an external weight and you're using your own body weight, it's super easy to cheat and to compensate. So you have to be humble and and really give priority to the technique one of the most important factors that uh, that say that you are performing an exercise with good technique is going to be the range of motion you know simply think all the way up all the way down is a good way to go and all the way up needs, needs all the way up and all the way down you know you're really extending your arm completely not slightly bent completely we need that in calisthenics calisthenics means the art you know uh, i actually don't remember exactly i think it's a beautiful strength anyways the art of expressing strength through moving your body against the gravity and so prioritizing the technique is the essence of of calisthenics right and um and so yeah, so if you if you see that you're struggling with an exercise, especially with pull-ups, step back and find a variation that's going to allow you to prioritize technique and progress from there. Um, mm. I mean, do you? I I can go on. I think forever here. Do you have any specific questions? about um, maybe yeah, some no. specific struggle that you see your followers doing, having. If you're enjoying the video this far, you like my free community full of like-minded people looking to get fit, vibrant, healthy, lean, happy, you name it, energetic. Yeah, so I'll leave that top link in the description. Enjoy the rest of the video and eat your fruit, baby. Mm. 
Yeah, that was great. I think you touched on a lot of good points. Um, yeah, there's so many. I think a lot of the a lot of the time, like you said earlier, people just do like a few push ups, a few pull ups, and they don't track their workouts. They don't progressively overload, and they just expect to get stronger and more muscular. Um, but in terms of like let's say um, foundational exercises in calisthenics, in my mind, it's like pull ups, push ups, dips, maybe like pike push ups for shoulders maybe leg raises what 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 kind of what movement should people um master it's a good question so as a like list of exercises we always have but well, overall like uh, it's important also to keep it simple all right you can you can get lost into a lot of different variation of exercises but uh if your goal is really building strength and muscle, you gotta keep it simple and uh, focus on the basic movement patterns. So we have what pull-ups, push-ups, dips, high push-ups um, that then will transfer into into handstand push-ups, right? And and yeah, so and then for the core, L sits is one of my favorite exercises and toes to bar, which can start from hanging knee raises to hanging leg raises and then slowly building your way up to um, to toes to bar in which you hang from the bar and you bring your feet to the bar. Uh, now, what I think is informative uh, to know is how do I think should the progression in exercises look mm. like for for a beginner. So the first thing that you want to work on is the basics. So getting strong with those basic movements of pull-ups, you know, whether you're starting with assistance, assisted pull-up, you want to build your way up to mastering the pull-ups. And then one of the mistakes that people do is jumping from pull-ups to muscle up. Right, that's that's not how it works. You do once you are at pull-up point, you're just grasping uh, the level of pulling strength that you need to do a muscle up and move forward towards more advanced calisthenics exercises. So stay there, stay on your pull-ups a little more. Add weights. Uh, you can do again unilateral variation, side to side pull-ups. Depending from your weight, you can do archer pull-ups. They might be a little difficult if you're more than 70 kilograms. Uh, but definitely, you know, just work on getting stronger with your pull-ups. Like doing, for example, three sets of five repetitions with 20 kilograms is going to be a good indicator that it's time to do muscle-up training. So when it comes to pull, mm -hmm. I'd say pull-ups, then kind of next level pull up strength and then you can start working on your on your muscle up once you're working on the muscle up you can start implementing as a secondary focus front lever okay but it needs to be secondary focus because here's another thing uh, people see calisthenics all of these different movements the planche handstand push-ups one arm pull up back lever and you want to do them all you cannot you need to if you want to progress efficiently you need to have i would say that it's better if you have one focus per muscle group so pulling muscle up for example then pushing handstand push up okay and then you move forward and you change the focus over time and so that's for pulling when it comes to pushing uh of course you need the basic strength to do push-ups but usually, in my experience with my clients, usually my clients, when they start with me, they are able to do or already push-ups. Um, so a lot of people perhaps would put you into do dips, but I prefer to have you focusing on high push-ups and then dips as a secondary exercise. If it's too hard for you, you can do them with assistance and you, as a beginner, you'll be able to still make progress with your dips, even though it's a secondary exercise. But the reason why I put the focus in the pipe push-ups, 
because then uh, I like to progress as um, towards the handstand push up, right? Of course, you could mm -hmm. progress in your pushing strength with like weighted dips, but you know, handstand push up is, is cool and uh, it transfer it trans the transfer very well in what you would probably want to do next in calisthenics, which is planche. So planche is mainly a shoulder focused exercise and handstand push-ups will make your shoulders ready to start working on planche. And uh, yeah, those are the main things. When it comes to organizing your workout, um, I think for me, in my opinion, you only need three exercises in your workout. You have your main exercise, mm -hmm. your secondary, your tertiary exercise. Um, you want to do between 15 to 20 sets per muscle group per week. 20 is optimal. And what's also optimal is to uh, split those sets between two workouts. So, so you hit the muscle twice per week and you have two opportunity per week to make progress in your main exercise. So you actually want to repeat, especially the first exercise, you want to do the same. So you can imagine, you know, you're doing three sets of five of the pike push up, your first push workout and your, your second, you can already three, uh, three sets of six and you progress two times per week, or at least this, this is the idea. And then uh, you want to, uh, Organize these three exercises in a way that the intensity decreases as you move within the workout and you move to the next exercise mm -hmm. and the volume, the volume increases. So, for example, you're focusing on developing your pulling strength uh, and you're doing pull ups, some variation of pull ups as your first exercise and you're doing this uh, three to five sets three to five repetitions, okay? So three to five repetitions is like the strength range. Working on this range allows us to move quicker towards more advanced and difficult variations uh, compared to if we are doing, uh, I don't know, you know, eight to 12 repetition, which by the way is one of the mistakes that people do. They get stuck with wanting to do 12, 15 pull-ups. I wanna do 20 pull-ups in a row. But again, strength endurance, it's a very specific work and it's not the most optimal. Uh, I'll, I'll say something about strength endurance. Uh, let, let's finish the organization of a workout plan. So first exercise, we focus on strength, three to five repetitions. Second exercise should be, a, so let's say we did, we did regular pull-ups as a first exercise. Our second exercise, what we can do is switching up choosing a different variation with the chin ups and with the palm facing us. Okay, so we are stimulating a little bit more the bicep while doing the chin ups, uh, but we will do the chin ups with the assistance. So we we'll use a band so we can do a minimum of uh, five repetitions uh, up to eight. It could be even in, even 10, you know, find, find the way you enjoy workout the most. Uh, that's also important to understand. And then our last exercise is where we're really getting into some kind of easy exercise that we can do at high repetition. That's going to help us uh, get our muscle to failure. And uh, for pull up, a pull training, pull workout could be Australian pull ups, which are horizontal pull ups. And uh, you do that between four to six sets eight to 15 or even 20 repetitions is still going to be effective to, to get that high. Uh, so now you notice that I've used rep ranges, right? So those rep ranges are not random. They indicate some important things in the workout. Uh, first of all, the minimum amount of repetition will indicate if you're working at the right intensity meaning that if you cannot match that minimum amount of repetition, the exercise is too difficult for you, okay? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to do something difficult when you are already tired. And that's why we do strength 
at the beginning of our workout. That's why we go intense and hard when you're fresh. That's when you can, another, this is another crazy thing that I see people doing in calisthenics part. So everyone wants to do a muscle up. Okay, cool. But why do you do after you already smashed three sets of pull-ups? Like you're already struggling with pull-ups. Then you want to do something that's more difficult after you've done 30 pull-ups? That's just not going to happen, man. Okay, so if you, for example, are already into muscle up, do it the first thing in your workout because that's your hardest pulling exercise. And then go into easy exercises after. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's the minimum. So the lowest number in our rep range, it tells us if the intensity and difficulty is right. And then the highest number is our goal. This is where we, what we want to achieve over the weeks. And once we are there, then we will be ready to reduce, uh, the volume again but increasing the intensity. So if I'm doing pull-ups and I got in one month time to three sets of five repetitions, what I can do now is adding five kilograms to my pull-ups and go back to lower volume. So three sets of three reps and, mm -hmm. and doing it again, doing it again over time. Um, does that sound good? Mm, that sounds great. I think that's a lot of good knowledge and info. I think definitely I, I agree. Like, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense to do like something intense at the end, like you say, because your form is going to be compromised. And yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so it sounds like you have a mixture of explosive at the start to develop that power and absolute strength. And then. That, that's mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to say uh, about strength endurance. So you mm -hmm. can make progress with high reps. That's possible. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you get stronger, it's going to be just easier for you to do high reps with an easier exercise. Just imagine if you can do pull-ups with 60 kilograms, isn't it going to be easier to do 20 pull-ups without, without the extra weight? Okay, so it's more effective, whatever is your goal, to bring up your strength. And then if you want to do a, in the future, perhaps you want to beat some kind of record with your pull-ups and push-ups, the strength is going to allow you to do that in a more efficient way. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And in terms of isolation exercises, like off... Oftentimes in the gym, people will like isolate individual muscle groups and muscles and things like, how do you feel about that? Are you purely like compound exercises or do you incorporate any like isolation? Uh, I do incorporate, uh, in my, in my second upper body workout, I do have a tricep, so three exercises in a circuit, uh, that isolate the bicep the tricep and the shoulder, but I, I, I never do it. I skip it all the time. <laughs> and because it's a um, time, just a time issue. Uh, but by the way, I do have the theory and I support the concept that, that you don't necessarily need to isolate your muscle in order to get stronger than and make them grow. Uh, because from the bodybuilding mindset, we got this idea that um, you have a bicep day and a back day, but in your back day, you're also using your bicep. So your, your bicep is flexing the, is flexing the elbow. So you mm -hmm. cannot do a pull up without using your bicep. Yes, there might be more emphasis in the back compared to the bicep, right? Compared to a chin up, for example, where the bicep is more simulated, but both exercises both, both uh, work work the bicep anyway so compound exercises for me are definitely uh, definitely king uh but uh, especially uh, because here's the thing when i've been a little more consistent with the isolation exercises my arms 
aesthetically did look better. They, they, mm. they did look more, more shaped. So this is one of the reasons why I do like to do isolation exercises. Um, but then there is also this guy, me. So this guy, actually I bought this book. So he's a calisthenics, uh, a weighted mm. calisthenics champion. And uh, he's, he's into it. Um, he has an ex accessory exercise to, to do the isolation exercises. So now I'm putting an extra effort to, to stick to it. And I actually found a solution to my time problem. Mm -hmm. So before, before I was trying to do my isolation exercises after, after my upper body workout. So it was, it was adding time to my workout. Uh, now what I do, I do it in super set with my leg uh, exercise. So in my leg day, I would do mm -hmm. squat, bicep curve, pistol squat, tricep push down, and uh, deadlift lateral raises. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I think if you want to optimize time, because most people, they're not a professional athlete, they want to optimize time, Definitely, you don't don't do don't do an arm day. I think you don't need an arm day. You can you can save the time. Just four four sets are enough for each you know muscle that you want to target. Or mm -hmm. or you not don't do it. If you don't do it, you will get uh, good results anyway. Even if you skip the isolation exercises, because again, uh, we also need to consider that I'm an I'm an experienced lifter. Right, I'm not a beginner, so I also I'm also trying to add details to my training so I can keep making progress. Right, so that's why for me perhaps becomes a little more important. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you saying that. Um, have you got time for a few more questions? Because I'm like in the flow. If, if you. Yeah, let's do it, man. I'm in the flow too. I like this. Cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, you touched on leg training. A lot of people say it's good to include weights uh, because you get to a point where you have to train in a really high rep range of calisthenics. How do you feel about that? What's your like approach to leg training and calisthenics? Yeah, they, they are right. They are right. You uh, you will have to do a lot of a lot of volume uh, with calisthenics. So uh, so as as I already mentioned, I am doing weight training for for my legs mm -hmm. so it's a mixture so this is actually how my workout looks i do weighted uh, so back squats with a barbell mm -hmm. that's my first exercise then i would do pistol squats and then i would do romanian deadlift uh, again mm -hmm. with the dumbbells and then i have a superset which is cc squats uh, in yeah, superset yeah. with side side lunges. So it's a mixture. So I, I still stick to some calisthenics exercises because I think they're very functional, especially like people are often scared that bringing your knee towards its full range of motion while yeah. doing some heavy lift or hard exercise can get you to be injured and injured your knee. But the reality is that the opposite is true. If you don't do that, you are putting your knee at risk of injury. So, of course, you need to build up to it slowly, do what's comfortable for you. But I personally uh, work with multiple clients that started with some kind of knee pain and knee discomfort. And we just made sure that we were doing things that we could do at the time without causing the discomfort, being able to do uh, a good amount of sets and reps. And then over time, uh, most of them have been able to perform a full depth pistol squat pain-free, okay? So developing that mobility and strength is very, very healthy, very healthy mm. for you. And I think this is what calisthenics and body weight leg exercise bring to the table to a leg workout. And uh, and I will never like focus on a full 
um, a full leg workout based on like machines and and weights only. So a mixture mm -hmm. is great. Uh, now, as a beginner, you can train with calisthenics and make a good amount of progress. Like doing a pistol squat is hard, not easy. Mm -hmm. It will take you to a good a good level. Uh, you can build some a good amount of muscles uh, by progressing towards a a pistol squat, like like doing doing like three sets of twelve pistol squats, for example, is not easy. It's hard. It's hard. So you have a lot that you can do uh, with your own body weight. However, unless you do only pistol squats at home. You will have to to do other exercises, and 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 there there aren't really other exercises that are as hard as pistol squat unless you add weight. And so there, there there's been a period in which I was training legs only at home because I wanted to save time, and uh, so I was focusing on many exercises that were single leg instead of two legs. To make them more difficult, so I would do pistol squat, I would do step ups, uh, lunges in superset with squats, and then I would do and then I would do one leg Romanian deadlift. So, as you can see, the way I tried to make my leg workout effective at home was focusing on single leg exercises and trying to create volume and fatigue with a superset. Uh, but I obviously needed to add some weight to the workout, even though it was a uh, single leg, because, I mean, uh, again, like, you can do a lot, but then once you become intermediate and experienced, like legs, legs are a very big and strong muscle, so they, they, they can do a lot. If you've ever seen like uh, Olympic weightlifters or power lifter, I mean, like, there are some crazy numbers there. People squatting 300 kilograms, strong men. They, they obviously they are still they are on steroids, but uh, you know it's still impressive to see people squatting 400 kilograms. So your legs have a lot of strength, and uh, they, they, you can make a lot of progress with them. Uh, but there is there is still something good about training leg with calisthenics at home because you don't actually need a lot of weight to make those mm -hmm. exercises effective if you do them with one leg, right? So for example, doing a Romanian deadlift with uh, one leg, uh, I, it was very effective for me and I was doing it with only, what was it? Um, I had a 20 kilogram kettlebell plus another 12 kilo, kilogram kettlebell and uh, it felt pretty good. It was challenging. But the only thing is that even though it was challenging, doing everything with single leg, it builds up a lot of ages. fatigue mm -hmm. and, takes, takes and takes longer as well. Uh, but mostly it builds up fatigue. And also there is the, uh, the, the balance factor in, right? So mm -hmm. it, it, it ju you just get more tired and you cannot really focus on uh, getting stronger and so I moved to I had to move to the gym and also what you said like even even the sets and reps that I was doing they were they had to be higher so I was I was staying more in the 10 to 15 repetition range rather than 8 10 because it was the only way to make to make progress so I think uh, that uh, once you can do pistol squats, it's time to go to the gym. Yes, you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are slowing your your progress if you if you keep trying and progress with calisthenics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for a lot of people, myself included, still there's a lot of challenge in like body weight variations, like you say. Um, but yeah, I, I like what you touched on about the knees over the toes as well. I'm sure you're aware of, um, I think his name's Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy. He he really yeah. stresses the importance of it. Yeah. Because like you say, it's actually not using that range of motion that causes the problems 
And then when people do go knees over toes, their body's not used to it and just causes all sorts of kind of issues. But if someone's looking to start, um, like what sort, what sort of equipment do they need to start calisthenics? Just say they're a beginner or maybe they've been going to the gym like a year. What, what sort of things should they get? So if you want to work out at home, again, like the, the good thing about calisthenics is uh, that you need a minimal equipment. Actually, a, you know, a funny, interesting story going back to COVID period is that, uh, so I was already doing calisthenics uh, during COVID since about, uh, I started maybe one or two years before COVID and a lot of people lost their gains because gym closed. A lot of personal trainers started to buy weight to do their weight training at home, everyone buying bands. I didn't need that. I didn't need that. I knew how to use my body weight to, to get stronger. And uh, I kept getting stronger at, at home with very minimal equipment. And all I had was a pull-up bar, so a doorway pull-up bar, and rings, and bands, and that, that's really all you need, okay, to get started, all you need, like, I suggest you have deep bars as well, mm -hmm. because you can do, you can use rings, like to do dips, for example, but dips are unstable, and the instability of rings make, makes the exercises uh, more difficult, so you are increasing the intensity and the difficulty. Uh, and for a beginner, it's probably not optimal. It would be better to have stable deep bars. But if not, you can adapt yourself to using using the rings. Uh, and that's it, really. Uh, so these are the basic stuff. Then some. So if I have to give a complete list. I think that is a good investment to buy a weighted vest. Um, 20 kilograms is the best buy because you can buy it uh, of 10 kilograms, but then you're probably going to need more in the future. So just buy a 20 kilogram one that's adjustable. Uh, parallets are a good tool as well. So parallets are like the push up handles. For example, when you do pike push-ups using the handles that will allow you for a greater greater range of motion. And um, what else? I, you know, you can, chalk, chalk is also important actually, you know, for gripping the bar properly. People underestimate mm -hmm. how important is using chalk during your training. Uh, lifting gloves, I don't know if you want smooth, hands to wank <laughs> then you need to use this gloves. but no actually actually it's not a good idea to to rely on the lifting gloves if even though you can use them when you start feeling too much pain on your hands it might happen in the beginning uh you uh, especially for calisthenics for calisthenics you you want to <clears throat> develop those calluses. You need those calluses to protect your hands uh, because if you don't develop them, what happens is that, that you're actually relying on gloves. And one day you are in holiday, you want to do your workout at the calisthenics park, you don't have your gloves. And, they, and once your hands start to get painful, you need to stop, you need to stop working out. So you need to develop those, those calluses. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, you know, that, that really, that, that's it. You don't need much equipment to be effective with calisthenics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of it and the simplicity. Yeah. That's kind of what appeals to me and a lot of people. And, and I think the fact that you, you can do it outdoors if, if, you know, you have the right equipment or like an outdoor frame or outdoor bar, that appeals to me a lot more as well. And just, Rings. Um, Rings are definitely... Mm. You know, especially mm. when you go on holiday, you go to a different environment, uh, bringing ring w rings with you is a game changer. You hang them mm. from whatever, a tree, a balcony, and uh, they really allow you to do a full effective workout wherever you are. Mm. Definitely. 
and then just finally kind of like for you personally are there any habits of you've done your workout you've like accumulated this fatigue how do you what kind of habits do you do to make sure you can recover and go again and build muscles so like maybe sleep or meditation or maybe like a post-workout smoothie what kind of things do you feel like are key to your success yeah habits that are key for for my success uh well i struggle with adhd well not i don't i don't struggle with it i just have it <laughs> i just have adhd uh but i i guess because of my impulsivity coming from adhd and my search for stimuli and uh, dopamine um, and uh, other environmental reasons i end up you know using drugs too for a very long period of time mm -hmm. and since very young and so what i've noticed is that my anxiety is worse when I keep stimulating my brain and I feed my addiction and I feed my desire of dopamine. And obviously these days what we have, and I don't, and probably most people don't realize, but a drug that's highly available is, is content. And guys, mm -hmm. I have, I've done cocaine, I've done MDMA, I've done a lot of MDMA and a lot of cocaine, especially. And uh, content, especially short form content is highly addictive. It's highly addictive. And, uh, and you know, you're probably listening to it. I don't know, Dylan, do, do you agree? Do you sometimes get lost for no fucking reason into scrolling? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I just have to yeah. post, post my reel and then click off. Otherwise, it's, it's a loop. Exactly. So it, you can get caught into it. And so one of the things that I noticed is that, um, and I learned, basically your brain has, has an X amount of dopamine that, that can give, that can release. Mm -hmm. So if you're conservative in the way that you're using your dopamine, um, you can reduce your anxiety level. You can feel clearer, think clearer, and so this is what this is what I'm trying to do: is limiting my uh, content consumption. I do that in the morning. In my morning, I will make sure that when I wake up, I don't look at my phone. I have breakfast. I make coffee, um, and then I will I will do a um, respiratory exercise so i bought this o2 trainer which is a resistance trainer for the lungs because i wanted mm -hmm. to try and see if that improved my asthma by the way now yeah now i'm at the 25th day i'm doing it every day um, and my asthma is definitely is definitely better and uh, the other thing that i do is it's also limiting my alcohol consumption so now i've been I've been almost three weeks sober, but if I am not sober, I would limit it to only one day per week. That's super important. Even if you drink one day per week, you would see that your your recovery is worse. And even if you drink one beer during the week and the day after you have to work out, you will feel it. So alcohol is is a no-no. Now, today we know that studies say that the, the, the only healthy amount of alcohol is zero. So, mm -hmm. so limiting alcohol is absolutely a big, a big thing. Uh, and then we have sleep, definitely. At 10, at 10 p.m. I have an alarm that tells me to disconnect and go to sleep. And I sleep about eight, to nine hours, I'm really someone that feels good with nine hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. But usually I get usually I get less. Usually I get eight, eight or seven. Uh, drinking enough water, people don't realize. You know they get busy throughout the day and they are dehydrated. 
especially you notice that you are, I, th I think one of the first symptoms of being dehydrated is a little bit of a headache. If you're noticing that you have a headache during the day, try and see if you're actually drinking enough water because maybe you're not, maybe you're not drinking two to three liters of water per day. And if you start doing that, you might, you might feel better. You don't have that headache. And obviously prioritizing whole food, especially, uh, especially fruit is already now, uh, for months, I have read a book. It's called the 801010 10 book. And uh, it talks about a, the benefits of a diet which is high in fruits. And honestly, what stuck with me the most is something super simple about the book, which is the fact that humans are, are primates and fruit is our uh, food specific, no, species specific food. Did I say that mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so it just makes sense. Like uh, we're not lions. So meat is definitely not for us. We're not baby cows. So milk is not, it's not made for us. Uh, I, I don't know what animals eat eggs really. I reptiles, I think do that. And, uh, grains, I didn't know about grains, but the book explains that uh, you need some specific enzymes to actually germinate those grains during the digestive system in order to get all the nutrients out of the grains. And this is something that birds are able, are able to do. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it just makes sense. And, and it just makes sense that, um, fruits is the most optimal food for us and our cousin chimpanzees and bonobos eat in very high quantities up to 75 percent to their diet is is fruit and the rest is still plants you know a mixture of you know greens and other vegetables and, and nuts and and that's and, you know i don't like to to make things look like they are the the magic pill and the magic solution but I do find fruit to be a very powerful uh, change inside of your diet. The increasing the intake of fruit has make me feel with good energy levels, even though I am eating less food. So in the beginning, we talked about my struggles with the caloric deficit and not eating enough. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm eating fruits, uh, something that happened is that I am I'm staying shredded and and lean or even losing fat without even noticing it. And I feel good. In the past, to do that, I would have to be very disciplined with what I'm eating. But now I can I can be a little more more loose on eating more because mm -hmm. fruit is filling, satiating, but it's also low, low in calories because for the most part what satiates you is the is the water content and the fiber content. Mm. And now you asked me about like post-workout or pre-workout food. I, that's also something I don't necessarily uh, believe in. I think if, if overall your diet is good, you're nourishing your body, you don't, yeah. you don't need to do that. You know, uh, something to be careful of, for perhaps if you are doing intermittent fasting, for example, uh, don't wait more than 12 hours, okay? It's because strength training requires you to have uh, your a good glycogen stored in your body. And what happens with fasting is that you're emptying those glycogen stores. And after 12 hours, if I remember correctly, they start to be depleted. And so you're probably not going to be very efficient within your workout. So make sure that you've eaten at least within 12 hours before you work out. I think that's enough, uh, but find your sweet spot. Personally, I, I don't do that. I want to eat. Uh, so I would have my breakfast about three hours before the workout. And, uh, and that feels, feels good to me. 
Um, and then another important thing that I do that and that and that I think it's uh, very important. Some people underestimate it is rest. So I don't I don't like. So first of all, I have one full rest day per week. So one so one day per week is I don't do nothing. I don't run. I don't do kickboxing. Perhaps I might go for a run, but it's going to be a super easy run, like an enjoyable run. Mm -hmm. I'm very, as of right now, I'm super conditioned to running, so I can make a run feel super easy, not like a workout, more of an, an enjoy, like some, like, I could say that is like a work for some people. You know, once you are into running for a long period of time, you can run a half marathon, running becomes kind of second nature as well. Mm -hmm. And so, but one, one rest day, absolutely super important. And the other thing, especially for the strength training is that some people do full body workout, for example, for me, full body workout do not give enough rest to the muscle. I like to have that push, mm -hmm. pull legs. You have three days rest before you hit your pushing and pulling upper body muscle again. And this allows for complete rest basically. And you can literally do uh, small, you can make progress each workout. If you do full body workouts three times per week, what happens is that you can, you simply cannot do that. You cannot progress workout after workout. You need to play with the intensity. So you need some workouts need to be easier. And I just don't like that lack of progression. I like to make progress workout after workout. Mm. And I think those are the main thing that I do, but uh, stretching, stretching also mm. very important. I, I struggled with uh, lower back pain and shoulder impingement, as well as some knee discomfort in the past. And all this has gone away over time as I focused more and more with uh, to uh, into mobility work. Yeah, right. So, and uh, if you go, if you do have lower back problem, if you have some recurring shoulder injury, you go to a doctor and a chiropractor. They unfortunately are likely, because I've, 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 I've gone to many, you know, like uh, I struggled a lot with my lower back pain. I had a year when I had to stop training and everything. And uh, I've been to doctor, MRI. They gave me medicines for muscle relaxation. They gave me painkillers. <clears throat> Actually, the first time I went to a doctor for the lower back pain, he was like, yeah, take 400 grams of ibuprofen three times per day. Come back to me in three weeks time. Three weeks later, I go and it's like, how's the back, <laughs> bro? Like, I'm drugged. I'm high on ibuprofen. I don't feel any. And uh, so they never fixed the real problem. And uh, finally, when I became a coach and looked more into mobility and I started to focus on it, uh, it helped me a lot to understand how to be efficient in increasing the range of motion of the different joints to a healthy state uh, is a book called Becoming a Supple Leopard from Kelly Starrett. And so I started the um, mobility work and and I don't get injured anymore. Like I was even, even like a shoulder impingement in the beginning of my calisthenics journey it was uh, something i struggled it was coming up every three months i was like what the fuck i need to stop training again and uh and the reason the reason why i was getting this shoulder impingement and again i went to different chiropractors and physiotherapists and all they were doing was massaging me and treating the shoulder and the muscle around but never testing my flexibility in the rotation of the joint and the flexion and extension of the joint. And what I had to find out, find out myself what I was, was that I was lacking internal rotation 
of the shoulder. And as I work on it, the 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 injury started to go away. Even because obviously this is a long term progress, right? You, you know, the, you don't improve your flexibility overnight with only mm -hmm. one stretching session. But as it got better and better, I noticed that even the time when I had a little bit of pain, just by doing the stretch of the, my internal rotation of the shoulder would, uh, would allow me to get pain-free and do the workout. So uh, mobility is definitely a big part of my ability to get stronger without get injured. Because again, that is it's long time I don't have a main, my major injury. Some discomfort, but they, they go away. Mm -hmm. And do you do that mobility before your workout? I think you said that earlier, didn't you? Or, or do you do it yeah. after as well? No, man, because I think I feel like after is uh, like the core. How many people like they finish the workout and they don't want to do the core, right? They, they don't want to work the abs. And uh, for me, it was the same with the stretching part. You know, I finish a workout, I want to be done. So, so I do it before, before my workout. And, and there is also a benefit from it because, you know, some people do, you know, they, there's this difference between flexibility and mobility, right? right? So flexibility is your ability to uh, move your joints, you know, open up your joints, rotate the joints, within a range of motion. And then mobility is the ability to exert strength as well on those, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and ranges of motion. So now some people do specific work in which you took a little uh, light weight and you work your way around your the range of motion of the joint, but uh, for me, that's unnecessary because at the end of the day, the mobility that you need is what you, you do in, the, in your training and uh, in your daily life. So for training, if I am doing flexibility work before my workout and I make this flexibility work relatable to the exercise that I'm going to be doing, for example... I am doing pull-ups. What's going to happen during the pull-ups? I'm going to flex my shoulder and being this and being in this end range position of the shoulder. So if I do hanging right before my pull workout, I am creating extra space in my joint. I'm creating more flexibility. And then when I do my pull-ups, and I bring my shoulder through that range of motion, I create strength and I make my joint mobile. And so that's the concept behind doing mobility work and flexibility work, which, which anyway is, is also, can be also called mobility work before, before the, um, the workout. And, um, Something that I learned about the mobility is that it is very important to to do less positions, but for longer period of time. So if you have mm -hmm. little time to do your mobility work, don't try to do ten different stretches. Do three or four, but spend one minute, two minutes per position. Okay, mm -hmm. and so that that's that's the reason why i do mobility work yeah before the workouts mm -hmm. perfect yeah and and it also serves as like a warm-up doesn't it it's like yes yeah, to this yes yeah, key um and yeah uh, yeah I like another thing about doing mobility before is like often you know some sometimes you don't feel like training like you i don't know maybe you you feel cozy mm. or 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 lazy and you and you think about doing pull-ups and you're like wow Fuck, that's hard. I don't want to do that. Um, and if you start with uh, light flexibility work and do, you do stretching, you ease into it. You start moving and you start feeling more like, oh, okay, 
I'm I'm ready. I'm I'm waking up. I can do this workout today. So yeah, mm. that's also yeah. a good way to start your workout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the amount of times I I'm like at the beginning of a workout or just warming up, and I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should just rest today or something, and then then I get it going. Happens. And like like you say, you just you just feel so much better when, and it's one of your best workouts ever. So it's like, <laughs> like you say, it's just uh, easing yourself into it. But yeah, if you want, we can finish with um, some rapid fire questions because I'm getting conscious of the time. So if you haven't seen these before, it's just a um, few questions and the idea is just answer them as fast as you can. And yeah. As fast as I can. Okay. I don't, <laughs> I don't, yeah. I'm not dumb, but uh, I kind of have a slow brain, you know. Let's see how fast nah. I can I can give the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, your brain's been good up to, up until now. You've uh, <laughs> engaged me with the conversation. Okay, so uh, number one, what's your favorite fruit? Watermelon. Mm, yeah. Uh, describe yourself in one word. Uh, distracted. <laughs> what is one book that everyone needs to read? I'm, I'm thinking about something that really changed, changed my life. Um, I liked, I really liked deep work. Deep work, yeah. For someone who like is how, how define how himself how. as uh, distracted, deep work. Deep, mm -hmm. deep work is, is a way of you know, concentrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Um, all right. That's a good one. Yeah. That... Um, Happiness is about being yourself and not being affected from other people's opinions about you or other people's reactions about uh, reactions to you being yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What are three things that you can't live without? Strength training. Um, three things I cannot live without. Strength training. My girlfriend. And f food. You know, like actually <laughs> food, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, what's your greatest strength and what's your biggest weakness? So it can be the same thing or two different things. Um, so, hi. Well, here we go. my greatest strength is uh, going to be my ability to be disciplined. So I, I can really put myself through hardship and things that I don't like to do without seeing results knowing that that's the thing that I have to do in order to mm. get the results. So that's definitely my biggest, my biggest strength. And my biggest weakness is insecurities it's because sometimes I, you know, I, I still, even though I, I know that the things that I'm doing are the right things to do, you know, sometimes you don't see the results directly and my, my insecurities uh, kick in and often make me feel overwhelmed, make me feel like I'm not enough. Mm. Mm. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, do you believe in having a purpose? If so, what's your purpose in life? Yes, I, I believe in, in having a purpose. For me, a purpose is living a positive 
mark on this planet. And I have decided that the positive mark that I am going to leave is going to be for the animals. And I want to do as much work as possible to reduce the amount of animal exploitation that is happening in the world. Mm. And finally, what are you grateful for today? This conversation, it was, uh, it was very good. I loved it. I had fun. And, um, but I think we, we, we need to also always be grateful for waking up, mm. waking up and, and have food and being able to breathe air and not being oppressed because animals wake up every day and they are oppressed and tortured and oftentimes, you know, you know and it, it doesn't happen directly. They will get murdered at some point. And you also have humans that wake up and there is war. So, uh, you know, it's important that in this moment where you feel anxious, overwhelmed, you're not doing enough, you don't have enough, whatever, you need to wait a second and say, okay, everything is good here. Like, I'm privileged. Mm, absolutely. And yeah, um, where can the people find you if they want to get in touch with you or want your coaching? Where can they reach out? Let's do it. So if you are a vegan man and uh, you want to build muscle to become a more confident man, and become a better role model for the vegan movement. Um, I have worked with more than 300 vegan men, helping them to build muscle with calisthenics. And uh, you can contact me if you're interest, interested in coaching on my Instagram, Stefano Vegan Calisthenics, uh, sending me a DM saying Cali Vegan. Or if you are not ready for coaching yet, I have a free guide that will give you uh, some very simple and applicable guidelines for your nutrition and your training. And you can download my free guide from the link in bio. So cool. my Instagram is Stefano Vegan Calisthenics. Mm -hmm. I'll put all the links below and all of that. But yeah, I appreciate good. the conversation and I appreciate people listening this far. And yeah, wishing everyone a wonderful day. Peace and love. Everyone. Thank you, man.